Let's move on to the weekend. Friday night. I think lines are just starting to trickle out here. Mike, you got something circled? I'll throw it to you. Yeah, let's start on the West Coast in the WAC. Seattle catching five and a half at Grand Canyon. Um, this one caught my eye just because Grand Canyon had built up an earned reputation of being a really strong home team over the last three or four years. But this year, it's just not the case. They're seven and eight against the closing number as a home team. They play slow. They're lousy defensively. They're 197th in Ken Palm's uh, defensive efficiency. Um, they foul a lot. They put teams on the line, and they're weak on the defensive glass. So I'm not afraid of that home court advantage. The last time that they played Seattle, they got in a rock fight. It was just an awful game. They ended up losing by five up in Seattle, despite the Red Hawks shooting 36% from the field. And they did it by sticking to the script that gets lined for 24 foul shots. But really, to me, is a bounce back spot for Cam Tyson, one of the best mid major guards, at least from a volume shooting perspective. He kind of comes from the old school Allen Iverson, um, you know, school of just get those shots up, and you probably are not going to have back to back lousy games. He hasn't had back to back single digit scoring games all season. He's coming off a two for nineteen stinker at home. I think he'll bounce back in this spot. And then from a motivational perspective, both of these teams are tied for fifth in the WAC. So they want to get to that that fourth spot because it's a buy all the way to the quarterfinals. So yep. motivationally, I think you're going to see the best basketball played by Seattle here. So if it does open north to five points, I'm going to go ahead with Seattle and take the points. Disrespecting the havocs of Grand Canyon. Hopefully they're not uh, listening and coming after you. BJ, what do you got? Well, first I got a, a quick story that leads into my pick. Um, so growing up in Cedar Rapids, there was a – a suburb called Hiawatha and in Hiawatha a place I went to many times was a place called sports zone. And they had, you know, they can you indoor... spell, can you spell that by the way? Is it one of the, I want to know if I would pronounce that H- right or wrong. Is... I A W A T H A. Wasn't okay. there a Hiawatha, a running back from Iowa state in like the mid two thousands. I may be making that up. I think it was just Maybe. post Seneca Wallace era. Anyway, beautiful, beautiful city. Went to <laughs> elementary school there, but anyway, that's not the point of the story. The point is, is, there was a place called Sports Zone that had, you know, a bunch of different things like indoor soccer, batting cages, mini golf. And they also had a basketball court that they purchased from a university, an old basketball court. And that college was the University of Jacksonville Dolphins. For whatever reason, in Hiawatha, Iowa, there's an old court. And I I texted my dad because I was like, if this court, if this place does still exists, because it's been a while since I've been there, I want you to go and take a picture of this court. Unfortunately, it's been closed for like the last five years, unknowingly to my knowledge. But so I like the Jacksonville Dolphins at minus one, not because, you know, that history, but I think this is a pretty good spot for them. They've lost six of the last seven games. Uh, three of their past four losses have come by a combined eight points. They're a very slow paced team. They love playing the half court and they've actually been pretty efficient in doing so. They're averaging over one point per possession in a sun play, which is sixth in the conference. They're shooting 58% at the rim. They have the second highest points of possession at the rim. And they're also a high range frequency mid range team. And they're also shooting 46% on those shot attempts. Eastern Kentucky, who they're playing is outside the top 300 in defending all of those areas. And Eastern Kentucky, they love to play in transition. They finish a high level at the rim, which Jacksonville doesn't do a good job defending, but Jacksonville has done a good job on the defensive glass this season, which is an area Eastern Kentucky uh, has been very good at. So, uh, and if you look at Eastern Kentucky, their bottom 15 has them metrics away from home metric. Uh, so I think this is a good spot for Jacksonville. Who's had a lot of late game variants go against them. The last few games I like them at home. It'll probably be around a pick them. I don't see a line out for it yet, but Ken Palm has it at Jacksonville minus one. So give me the dolphins. Funny stories. We have, uh, so our main producer, Matt Mitchell, is director of audio, does our college football episodes and a lot, some of our college basketball. But our other uh, producer who does this episode, he David, he has a in his backyard, like it's an outdoor uh, patio and it's the old New Mexico State. It's like a huge s- section of the old New Mexico State gym. Wow. And it, it says it was when they were in the whack and it, there, he has like the letters you can see whack is like part of the, that's the part of the uh, gym that he has uh, out on his back patio. So um, I love that story. I, the, the Jacksonville Dolphins. Yeah. In, in yeah. Hiawatha, Iowa of all places. Yeah. Cause it's obviously one of those courts that, you know, you can just like roll in, like it's not built into the floor, obviously. So yeah. they must've just like purchased it on, you know, for a cheap price when they were, Jacksonville was building the new floor. So yeah. Played many basketball games in that court. 
Hiawatha. I assume that's like an in, a Native American based name. Yeah. Yep. Um, Hiawatha okay. tribe that lived in Iowa. Yep. All right. I'm going to go with a team that has, there's two teams that have just owned me over the past two weeks. I'm probably going to fade them again this weekend because I'm stubborn. Uh, Texas A&M was one of them. And the other one is Marshall. Marshall, I mean, it's just been some really fortunate end game variants for Marshall. Games are just, you know, they're teams within the number and they extend within the final minute. But I've had this spot circled for a month and a half. They're going to Old Dominion. And Marshall's currently in first place in the conference. And they're playing pretty good basketball right now. They have excellent guards. They are ex- they want to do two things. They want to get out and transition and run. I mean, they want to run, run, run. They want to play up tempo and they run pick and roll at one of the highest rates. Uh, their middle pick and roll is one of the highest rates in the entire country. Well, Old Dominion really limits transition opportunities as well as really any team. They want to just grind the game down, playing at home. I think they'll be able to really control the tempo and they have an excellent pick and roll defense. They played earlier this year. And they lost by eight at Marshall, seventy-three to sixty-five. You know, I here's but here's the main reason why I think that you know number one, it's not the not the best spot for Marshall. Marshall is coming off of a, a pretty big win over James Madison two days ago. This is all, they played on Wednesday, and they won ninety-two to eighty-three. They have they have to have no legs left. This is a team that's been in. Some grinders, look, they had to come back in a miracle fashion against Georgia Southern at home. They won 84 to 83. I think they were down like 11 with a minute and a half to go. And they came back to win that game. So this is two days later. Why does that matter so much now? This team has no depth. They're 362nd in bench minutes in the country. They basically go 60. Now you have one day in between games. You were just at James Madison. Now you go to Old Dominion. And I don't think it's a great matchup. I think Old Dominion could slow this game down. I think we should we could be getting like hopefully five here, five and a half. Maybe it's a sharper line and it's a little lower. Um, but I, I think Old Dominion will control the tempo here. Marshall fatigue has to be coming. This is their but since February second, they've played, they were at App State, at Louisiana, at Coastal, at Georgia State come home to Georgia Southern and Troy, go to JMU, go to ODU. So this is their sixth road game out of eight total games in February with zero depth. So I think the legs catch up to them here in a a pretty favorable schematic matchup for ODU. So give me the Monarchs who are playing some decent basketball of late. Their press offense sucks, which is a bit of a concern. Um, But I think Old Dominion will keep this close right down to the wire. I actually think they pull off the mini upset. All right, that'll do it for Friday. Make sure you check out actionnetwork.com and the Action Network app for a more info and content on some of the games on Friday night. But let's get to why most of you are here, and that is our Saturday rundown. Rapid fire style. We'll we'll just go around the horn until we are out of plays. Mike, I will let you do the honors and kick us off. What's the first game you want to mention for Saturday? So UVA traveling to North Carolina, I would play this up to UVA minus three could open as a pick them at uh, Bart Torvik in terms of the projections. Listen, at what point do we just say North Carolina is what they is, you know, are what they are. They're 204th in shooting efficiency. They're 340th in three point, field goal percentage. I mean, they're threatening to get invited to the SEC at this point. They're 0-9 against quad one teams. I contend that Baycott is still, you know, one twisted ankle, you know, one hard fall on his hip away from just mailing in the rest of the season. He's been banged up the whole time. They don't put any pressure on you defensively. We we know what UVA is. They're a strong defensive team. They're 27th in Ken Palm. I agree with you, Stucky. They're not the elite teams on the defensive end that, you know, Bennett has put together, but they're good enough to stymie this North Carolina team that cannot shoot. And I think it's really just, you know, this line is probably going to open close to a pick just because Virginia has been so, you know, untrustworthy on the road. Let's say that. They're 2-7-1 against the spread when playing away from Charlottesville. 
but they can still win the ACC regular ti- regular season title. So I think you're going to see them bounce back from a 32% shooting percentage performance against BC. I think there's a little positive regression ahead of them. So like I said, if it's at one possession or tighter, I'll go ahead and play the Wahoos here. I've had it with this North Carolina team, you know, for whatever reason. I, I mean, obviously it's tied into them running to the national title last year, but they just don't have it. Brady Maddox not walking through that door. There's no one that's special on the perimeter. And because of that, I don't really care how talented they are. They've not shown up against any good teams this year. So I'll go ahead and play UVA. Yeah, it's just one of those things that everyone has had in their mind all year, like the run last year. Are they going to put it together? Are they going to put it together? And like I, they, the last time that they won multiple games in a row, it was when they beat Louisville, BC, NC State, and Syracuse. Uh, that's and then Wake Forest and Notre Dame. That's it in the new year. I mean, this is a team that just cannot put it together. They can't shoot. And I just the, the, the it's amazing to me that, like I mentioned earlier, losing Manic and going to Nance has been that much has had that much of an impact. But yeah, it's uh, it's ugly down at Chapel Hill, and they're definitely squarely on the bubble. BJ, what do you got? Let's go Gonzaga at home against St. Mary's in a nice revenge spot. Uh, the Zags, I think uh, I think that game kind of kicked them into high gear because they have been putting up just crazy offensive performances <laughs> since that loss. They put up over 1.2 points per possession in all four games and have basically been on a warpath. I mean, they put up 68 points in the first half against Loyola Marymount on the road. That in, a revenge, was, in a revenge spot there. In a revenge well. spot. Insane. And what's crazy about the previous game against St. Mary's is that St. Mary's did not make a single point from the post up or from the mid range, 42 of their 78 points came right at the rim or from free throws. And then obviously uh, from three point range as well. Gonzaga has obviously been terrible at defending the rim, but Gonzaga in that game only grabbed three offensive rebounds. They're the best offensive re- rebounding team in the WCC. I understand St. Mary's is a very good defensive rebounding team, but regression should tell you that Gonzaga is going to grab more than three offensive rebounds. And since that win over Gonzaga, St. Mary's has gone through a very, very weird stretch. They raced out to a 16-0 lead against Loyola Marymount, end up losing to them in overtime. They're up 58-35 to against San Diego, who's one of the worst defensive teams in college basketball. And they were only able to score three points over that final 11-minute stretch, and only ended up winning the game by three, and then they failed to cover against BYU at home last weekend. So... I think this is a great spot here for Gonzaga at home. Ken Palm has a minus two, a great revenge spot for them. I'm sure they'll get steamed up a little bit. So I'm going to play Gonzaga at the opener, and I think they get their revenge against St. Mary's. Yeah, I, to I totally speak. agree with you, BJ, there. That that was one of the games I had circled. And what you laid out, also that BYU game was a one-point game with under two minutes to go. Right. So there's just something wrong in terms of their overall momentum right now. Logan Johnson couldn't throw it in the ocean the last time they played. And Mahaney, we all love him, but he's playing as freshmen do from time to time. Just once in his last seven games has he shot better than 46% from the floor. So I think what's going to happen is he needs to play his best game, and the kennel is going to be an absolute zoo for this rematch. So I think they're walking right into a buzzsaw in this game. Yeah. Yeah, and if you remember, he had to go bananas at the end. And they got to overtime, but Gonzaga was in control for a majority of that game. So I agree, had that one circled as well. Uh, let's, I'm going to go chronologically. So I'll start off at noon, BJ, to make you happy. I'm going Iowa. Yes. At home against Michigan State. Love it. I love, I love this spot. It's, it's just a tough spot for Michigan State. Emotional week on campus. Uh, thoughts are with anyone that was impacted by the school shooting there in East Lansing, but you know, they, you know, so you're dealing with all of that, but they, they also got a huge win over Indiana and now they travel to Iowa city to take on a desperate Hawkeyes team that just dropped two straight on the road, but they're coming back home. And that means Iowa should get back on track. Like most big 10 teams. This is a theme that just will not end this year. They've thrived at home. They've gone seven and league play in 2023 on the season, big 10 home teams. In conference play, 71, 41, and one against the spread. That's 63.4%. Most profitable conference by a wide margin. How about short home favorites between one and three, which is what Iowa should be here? 18 and five against the spread, 78.3%. Iowa also, since 2005, the fourth most profitable team in conference play at home. They also have revenge from an earlier season meeting against Michigan State. And if you recall in that game, Patrick McCaffrey didn't play, he's now available. 
but they still almost won and probably should have won despite shooting three of 17 from three, yep. six of 13 from the line. And they still had a chance to win it. And I think they had a wide open shot at the end and they ended up covering two and a half. They lost by two. Uh, I think that they can use Michigan state's been really bad against the press. They're vulnerable mm-hmm. against zone. So you can see Iowa break out a higher frequency of their zone and press here. I think this is a great spot to buy Iowa at home, continue the trend of big 10 home teams cleaning up against the number uh bj you agree here iowa spot oh yeah this is a hammer time iowa spot i mean i i I obviously follow a lot of hawkeye reporters on twitter and they just kept like the the tweets just kept rolling in i was three of 48 from behind the arc they're three of 50 from behind the arc like they're gonna shoot they're not that bad of a three-point shooting team eventually they're gonna make some shots so i agree with you this is a fantastic spot for them yeah they're due to have a game where they go like 10 of 20 and then they win at home and everything's fine at times city men again yep and then they win, they'll win this game by like 24. Um, Mike, let me throw it back to you. What do you got? So I've only called my shot on one big money line upset on a Saturday game all year, and that was Hofstra upsetting Charleston in the CAA. I'm going to go for it again here. If I can get it north of three to one, Arkansas money line over Alabama. We don't need to get wow. into all the distractions for Alabama, but I'll lay this out for you. Nick Smith Jr. is back to playing starters minutes. You accurately brought up the fact that it was a little bit strange how they're working him back into the starting lineup plays 32 minutes against florida 29 minutes against georgia scored 26 against georgia they're seven and two straight up with smith in the lineup but what i care about more so is that their offensive ceiling goes way up because what we know whether he's in the lineup or not this is a really good defensive team 12th in ken palm's defensive efficiency they force 14 and a half turnovers per game their effective field goal percentage defense is 19th nationally and the key number, circle it on the board, they are holding opponents to 5.4 made three-pointers per game. That's ninth nationally. What does Alabama want to do? They want to give it to Brandon Miller, get him to the 10. Is he going to play? Is you know, is he going to be distracted finally? Is he going to have another vintage performance? We don't know. But I do know the rest of the team wants to bomb away from three. I think that plays into Arkansas's hands. So like I said, if it's north of three to one, I'm going to go woo pig suey. Shout out Colin Wilson on the Big Bets on Campus podcast. I think this is the time for Arkansas to get their signature win of 2023. Yeah, and and insane that, and of course this happens to Texas a and this happened with, but Nick Smith, they don't play him. They only plays four minutes against uh, Texas A&M, doesn't play the second half, and Musselman's like, well, we just needed the win. It was an injury. And then he plays 32 minutes the next two games, and they, they win a blowout fashion. It's like, well, what the hell are you doing against Texas A&M? Anyway, uh, yeah, Arkansas definitely becomes exponentially more dangerous with a healthy Smith playing those minutes. BJ, so bold call there by Mike. BJ, what do you got? I'm going to go to the Summit League. Let's go North Dakota State at home against Western Illinois. I think this is a really good spot for the Bison. So Western Illinois is going to be coming off back-to-back road games. They just beat North Dakota here on Thursday morning, 81-70, to while North Dakota State is going to get back-to-back home games. Western Illinois is a very high-volume three-point shooting team, and they move the ball very well to create those good opportunities. They're the number one team in the summit in assist field goal percentage, and they're fifth in the country in open three-point rate. North Dakota State defensively is second in the conference in shot selection allowed. They're first in rim and three-point rate allowed. They're second in shot making allowed. In the first meeting between Western Illinois, they went berserk from beyond the arc, 10 of 22. When for the season, they're only shooting a little under 32% from beyond the arc. These are two of the highest frequency half-court teams in the country. North Dakota State is very good at defending in the half-court. They're second in points for possession allowed. And it's a North Dakota State team that loves to play inside out. They do a ton of post-up sets. Their top 10 frequency team in catch and shoot three pointers. Western Illinois is 358th in the country in open three point allowed. And they're outside the top 200 in defending post upsets. They're also last in the summit in two point field goal percentage allowed. In the previous meeting, North Dakota State went one of 17 from beyond the arc against Western Illinois. And Western Illinois is a team that plays a six man rotation. They're 355th in bench minutes. So the legs have to be a little tired heading up north to play the two North Dakota schools. Ken Palm has it said North Dakota State minus seven. So I like the value on the Bison to get their revenge from losing on the opening week of summit play to Western Illinois. Yeah, important game for seeding. And, and Western Illinois, yeah, Trenton Master is amazing. He can always go bananas, but yeah, I, I do. I do agree. I like the the matchup. North you know, Western Illinois wants to run you off the three point line. That's not really going to impact this North Dakota State offense. So I do think that it's a pretty good spot. Uh, I'm going to throw out. I already mentioned Mississippi State against Texas A and M. 
this has to be the peak of, you know, it's not a great matchup. Yeah. Like for a couple of reasons, because number one, like I mentioned before, Mississippi state cannot shoot and they will turn the ball over at times, but I do think that they can live on the offensive glass. And this has just from a numbers perspective, I think this is the peak of the market on Texas A&M going up against a Mississippi state team. That's playing probably its best basketball of the year. They're only six and four of their past 10 games. But if you look at those losses, I mean, they're all by three or less, you know, it's three at Alabama. It's an overtime on a buzzer beater against Missouri. So they're playing a lot better now. They can't shoot, but I do think that they still have some positive regression coming. If you just look at their unguarded jumper numbers, they're not this bad. So I think that there's some positive regression looming. So I already mentioned that one. I also go with Oklahoma State at home against Kansas State. Kansas State is just uh, – they might have the best home court advantage this year in college basketball. If you look at Haslam metrics, they're 353rd in his away from home metric. They dropped five straight away from home. They're now coming off of uh, two massive wins in Manhattan against Iowa State and Baylor. Meanwhile, you have Oklahoma State, which is coming off uh, three straight losses. And from a matchup perspective, Oklahoma State really, really effective at defending cutting action, which is basically Kansas State's entire offense. And they're in the Oklahoma State's 97th percentile in that department, points per possession allowed. Kansas State's also not really efficient in transition. That's where you have to beat Oklahoma State before it gets set in, in the half court where it's absolutely elite. On the other side of the ball, they can Oklahoma State should be able to clean up on the offensive glass here. They'll also have their seven-footer back who didn't play in the first meeting. And their bigger guards can, I think, penetrate here and have advantages on the outside. So I think this is a great buy low, sell high spot on the pokes. Mike, you have anything else? Any other bold calls or anything else you want to bring up for Saturday? I have one more break glass in case of emergency play, just because BJ and I agreed on Gonzaga and St. Mary's. Um, one last time, go to the well over Detroit and Wright State. <laughs> Anything below 160, slam the over there. Wright State's gone over in five of the last six. Um, their last game was bananas. Where they lost on a half quarter. Um, Detroit Mercy, obviously, Antoine Davis is going to bomb away from three. They're both going to play fast. They're, I believe, the second and third best over bets in the horizon. So because it's you know it's such a low volume game in terms of overall tickets, I still don't think that books have adjusted to them enough. So like I said, if it's below 160, go ahead and play the over just to get your Saturday started off in the right way. I believe it's a, a noon tip. Love it. BJ, anything I'll else? Go one more. Yeah, I'll go one more. Um, and this doesn't really qualify as a good spot, but I, I do like Indiana on the road against Purdue. Uh, I know it's a revenge spot for Purdue coming off that, but Indiana did actually a very good job on defensively on Edie in that game. I mean, they, I mean, Purdue had 16 points off post upsets, but those shots were were very, very difficult. Cause if you look at the shot quality on those post upsets, they're only supposed to score around 10 points. Purdue also turned the ball over 16 times in that game. It's been their biggest problem all season long. They're dead last in the big 10 in turnover percentage and offense. And what's crazy is that Indiana, they actually underperformed scoring at the rim at that game. They scored 24 points there. Shot quality tells you they should have scored around 30. Indian is a heavy pick and roll team. They utilize a ton of post upsets, obviously with Tra- Trace Jackson Davis, and they're a high frequency team finishing at the rim. Purdue really isn't that elite at defending those three areas. They're fifth in the Big Ten in points per possession allowed off pick and rolls. They're seventh in points per possession allowed at the rim, and fourth in points per possession allowed off a of post upset. So Ken Palm has us at Purdue minus seven. It may, I may look like an idiot. That's fine. I've been looked like an idiot many times, but I still think the matchup is pretty good here for Indiana. So if I can get Indiana at plus seven or better, they're obviously coming off a road loss to Michigan State. So give me the Hoosiers if I can get them at plus seven or better. Love it. Um, and go Hoosiers. Who, who, who? Uh, let's go to the Patriot League. Give me, I'm going to take Navy here. Game should be around a pick at home against Colgate. Colgate's not playing for anything here. They have the one seed locked up. They already won the Patriot League regular season title. Now, if Lehigh wins earlier in the, in the day, Navy, or if they lose, Navy will have the two seed locked up. If Lehigh wins, then Navy will have to win here for the two seed, which could be important. Higher seed host games in the Patriot League. Regardless, uh, you know, maybe if Lehigh loses, then Navy might rest people later in the day, because that game's at four. I don't think that's going to happen. I think regardless of what happens in the Lehigh game, Navy wants this game, and I'll explain why. 
Navy has, they have six seniors in their regular rotation that have played four years here in Annapolis. And they're 0 and 6 against Colgate, including a loss in last year's conference tournament title game. They got blown out earlier this year, but Navy earlier this year was playing just horrendous basketball. They, I think they, they lost five straight to, you know, at the start of the calendar year in Patriot League play. They've gone 10 and one since. And just to illustrate how much they've improved, those five losses, they have six losses in, in conference play, including one to, to Colgate. But the other five losses, they lost to Holy Cross, they lost by 11. The latest meeting, they won by 18. Lehigh, they lost by five. The latest meeting, they won by 12. Lafayette, they lost by nine. The latest meeting, they won by 19. Loyola, Maryland, they lost by two. The latest meeting, they won by 12. American, they lost by four. The latest meeting, they won by 16. Those are the five losses, five of the lo- six losses that they had early in the year. The sixth is Colgate. They beat Colgate this weekend. They go 6-0 and straight up and against the spread. The previous five, they all won by double digits. An average turnaround in those games of 21 points. I think Navy really wants this game. Colgate's not really playing for anything. So I think the mids are the play here. They're playing really good basketball. I'll throw out a couple other ones. Boise State, the classic sandwich spot here. Taking on San Jose State after a couple blowout losses. I think you'll get a fully focused Spartans team here. But Boise State, look, they they held on against New Mexico last night. And now the quick turnaround, they go on the road to San Jose State. In the, Next up, they have San Diego State. And again, that could decide the entire conference. So, you know, it's not a bad matchup for San Jose State. They lost by three at Boise. Boise also has no depth. Bottom 10 in bench minutes. Marcus Shaver got banged up again, bruised and battered all game. And now they're playing their third game in six days late in the season in a classic sandwich spot. I think you can get San Jose State as a valuable home dog here. I also am going to trust New Mexico at home against the cured Mike. I'm curious to get your thoughts if you have any here. I know you wrote off New Mexico after that blowout loss to Wyoming, but San Diego state, they're running pretty well on the road. Like they've won four or five in the road, they, but they needed overtime against Colorado state. They won the Fresno by two. Um, they had another win by two points against uh, Utah state. New Mexico beat them early in the year. They need this game. The pit is going to be lit. They've lost five of six. I'm going to think I'm going to try to buy low in New Mexico here. They didn't have Jalen house for two of those losses. I'll throw them out. The other two were pretty unlucky against Nevada. They beat San Diego State earlier in the season. So I do think San Diego State will show up here motivated. But you need quick guards that can get to the rim, that can dribble penetrate to beat that drop coverage of San Diego State. That's what New Mexico has with House and Mashburn. So, uh, you know, it's this is going to be an electric atmosphere. We might get a few calls here. I'm going to buy low on New Mexico in a game that they might need to have to make the tournament. Do you, do you agree or disagree there, Mike? I, mean, I think they absolutely have to have it to make the tournament and they got to win some games in Mountain West conference tournament. Um, my only concern is that Jalen house, even before the injury, he, he's had just a rough shooting month. I think he shot over 40% once in the entire month. They need him to play an efficient game. They don't necessarily need him to score a ton, but he can't take like 15 shots and make five of them. Like that, that just kind of sinks their battleship right from the, the get go. And also when you bring up that game against Boise, who man, one of the worst melts of the entire gambling season. I think they went one for eight or missed their last Sh- seven Shaver foul shots. missed and the six fu- free throws in the final minute. His name is Marcus and then Shaver, top- people. His name yeah. is Marcus Shaver. <laughs> Sometimes it's just it's not even the the play by play. It's the actual aesthetics. The final possession too. They almost cough up the ball in mid court, and then because of it, the defense collapsed on them, and they let up a wide open three with two seconds left. Just absolutely brutal um i i mean you're a braver man than me to go back on the lobos but i do agree they're playing at home so if there was a time to circle the wagons it's at the pit yeah I'm, i'll do a quick little rapid fire here south dakota state first team to go undefeated in some of the play last year oral roberts is might be trying we'll see if they do tonight to be the second at south dakota state on saturday won by 40 earlier this year against south dakota state it won't be that easy this year, I, South Dakota State, the past 20 years, most profitable home team against the spread in league play. You might get value here with the Jacks. They'll be fired up. Might be a decent spot to back Georgia. Missouri, not the same team away from home. 
Georgia can get out and transition in that matchup. They need to do that in order to have any success. USC, the dreaded back end of the mountain trip. They go to Utah after facing Colorado on Thursday. For what it's worth, teams playing their second straight road game in Utah with three or few di- fewer days of rest, 16 and 29 and three against the spread that's 35.6% over the past 20 years. I would have to say, if you're is you if you want to be bold and you want to be brave, how can Kansas, after what they've done, and Marquette not be at the very top of their value in the market? That means you'll have to play West Virginia on the road at Fog, and you'll have to play DePaul on the road at Marquette. But it could be a super flat spot for Marquette after you know wins over Xavier Creighton by a combined what three points, both in the final seconds. They now basically have won the Big East. They're up by two games with three remaining. And they're like an energy team, right? So a lot of what they do is just so much energy on both ends of the floor. They play so hard. So if they come out a little flat here, DePaul can, you know, DePaul can buy you five to five to six minutes where Marquette's a little lethargic, and that could be the difference in a cover or not. DePaul's getting a little healthier. They're still trying, it looks like. So yeah, I think that. Kansas and you got to hold your nose, but Kansas and Marquette are probably at the peak of their market value. Uh, anything else you want to add, boys, before we get out of here? Well, I would say I think we'll all be better off if BJ can just make a dolphin noise to go along with his Jacksonville play, because oh I think that'll gosh. be the the luck that we need to push it over the top. Ah, ah, that was terrible. <laughs> oh my gosh. <laughs> I think some, some thank you, Oliver. Someone That's about as good was, as I can do. Someone was dying. Um, yeah. All right. Good stuff, gentlemen. Uh, thanks for cu- filling in for me earlier this week. Thanks to all of you for tuning in. Thanks, as always, to Mike, BJ, and, of course, the guys from the three-man we do, who take care of the midweek episode. As I said earlier, starting next week, we'll have conference tournament previews starting Monday for the ones that start Monday. Make sure you subscribe, unsubscribe, subscribe. Leave a review. Remember, best review over the next week will be able to split our futures portfolio as we head in to the madness. March is coming. Thanks to our sponsor, BetMGM. Thanks to our audio and video team on the back end. Saturday morning, 10.30 a.m., Big Bets on Campus Live. Mike, the host, with the guys from 3 Man Weave. Make sure you check that out. We'll be back Monday. Thanks for tuning in. Good luck on all of your wagers. We'll catch you all later. Cheers.